let me start by telling you that when I was about fifth grade or so, I went to a church camp in uh, Tennessee, Illinois, which is close to Carthage, Illinois, if you know where that's at. But it was Lemoyne Christian Service Camp. And I went there, and you know on the last day of camp, maybe you know this, maybe you don't, but they usually have the kids pick up their, me- or clean up their mess that they made all week. So we're doing that, and my team gets assigned to the dorms, so I'm alone in the dorms, and I'm cleaning up my area, and I see a $5 bill on the ground. And I don't know about you, but when you're five, excuse me, when you're, when you're in fifth grade, $5 is a lot. First service, I said when you're, five, when you're $5, but no. When you're in fifth grade, $5 seems like a lot of money. So I, I took it. I didn't have any regard for whose it was, apparently. And I was, I was fantasizing how I might spend it. I think I could buy 10 sodas with that. So I was like, oh, it's going to be a good, good trip home. But the thing is, is that I took it with no regard for who it was, but the problem was is that I knew I shouldn't have done that. And, but aren't we all like that? We see something that we want, and so we take it. You know, right now we're in week four of our series on the heart. And, and we've been talking about different th- lessons we can learn from the life of David. Last week, we kind of left David in a pretty awkward spot. He was doing the Philistines' dirty work. He was basically their mercenary. And and he was going around doing their stuff for them. And and we learned from that that if we are going to be people who live like God's, who follow God's own heart, we need to know that our strength comes from God. And and we learned that lesson, and I think that's a valuable lesson. But today I want to take a look at this question What do we do when no one's around? How should we live our lives when it seems like no one's watching? If you're me, I would have answered that question by taking the $5 bill. I would have said, you know, take what you want. No one's going to stop you. But David, the guy we've been looking at through this series, he had to answer this question for himself too. You see, we're fast forwarding quite, quite a bit in David's life. He's no longer on the run from Saul because Saul's dead. He's the king. Saul and Jonathan fall in battle. And after David mourns Saul and his best friend, David takes over the throne. And David starts his reign by squashing some civil wars by this guy named Ishbosheth. I don't know what it is about kids, but we just don't name them the same. I love that. Ishbosheth. And he, he, he finds himself having a conversation conversation with God where God tells David that from his lineage Christ will come Uh, now that's big news like this is what the whole Jewish faith has been living up to and know that that comes from your lineage that's a that's great news I'm sure and so David's uh, he has a really really great start and that's where we find him today. He has a great, he's very successful. So if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 11. Give you a second just to turn there. 2 Samuel chapter 11. We're going to pick up our story in verse 1. Let's go ahead and read the first few verses. We're going to see here that David, he's pro- he might be slacking on his kingly duties. And I don't know if it's because of the success that's gotten to his head or if something else is going on. But at one point or another, he decided that he wasn't going to go to war with his troops. Let's read and see what he does with his, with his free time, I guess. All right, verse 1 says this. Then it happened in the spring, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the sons of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David stayed at Jerusalem. Now when evening came, David arose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful in appearance. So David sent and inquired about the woman. 
And one said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? David sent messengers and took her. And when she came to him, he lay with her. And when she had purified herself from her uncleanliness, she returned to her house. When you're alone, how, how do you live your life? You know, if we're David in the story, thinking of all the success, all the fame, all the money that he wanted was in his hand. But the thing with success is it never quite satisfies. We always need one more win. And he's looking for his identity and success. And after waking up from his afternoon nap one day, he is walking around on his roof, and he sees a woman in the distance. And, and it's almost like the narrator is telling us that there's trouble right around the corner because it gives us the note that, and she was very beautiful. Let's just say, if, if that woman was a $5 bill, I would have taken it. David took Bathsheba, even knowing that she was the husband, or she was the wife of someone, of Uriah the Hittite, and he had relations with her. But sometimes consequences always follow our sins, don't they? You know, it's kind of a, a law of nature. It's cause and effect. You do something, and there's always an equal and opposite reaction. And the thing is, is when I took that money, when I took that money from the camp, I knew God was giving me a chance to make it right. Because a few minutes later, some kid comes in looking for $5. I didn't give it back. And I was eaten up with guilt because of that. There are consequences for our actions. David's about to find out what his consequence is. Let's read the next verse. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 5 says this. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David and said, I am pregnant. Those three words are powerful, aren't they? If you're a couple wanting to bring a child into the world, those can be the three best words you can hear. But I can tell you that not everyone has that intention. If, if they do not plan on having a child, those three words can create panic. They can destroy relationships. And they can make us very angry. And so our tendency is that we start to think about ways that we can remove those consequences. We start to look for ways that we can remove the consequences. And we do that too. There's plenty of ways that we can get rid of pregnancies. Oh, we can get an abortion. Uh, but, but sex isn't the only sin that we try to remove the consequences of. We would rather go on a, a spree of lying than tell the truth. We would rather put on a fake face rather than say what's really going on. And I think we do this because we're scared of the consequences. Uh, and... David struggled with this too. David was not about to have the consequences of these sin. And he's going to try and remove the consequences by trying to make like Uriah was the father of the kid. Let's check out what the story says in 2 Samuel 11, verses 6 through 13. It says this. Then David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked concerning the welfare of Joab and the people in the state of the war. David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house, and a present from the king was sent out after him. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. Now when they told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, 
the ark, and Israel, and Judah are staying in temporary shelters. And my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and lie with my wife? By your life and the life of your soul, I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, well, stay here today also, and tomorrow I'll let you go. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Now David called him, and he ate and drank before him, and he made him drunk. And in the evening he went out to lie on his bed with the Lord's servants, but he still did not go down to his house. David was really hoping that he could convince Uriah to go home and be with his wife. So that the child wouldn't be a surprise. So that Uriah might think that this was his child and he wouldn't ask questions. But Uriah was a man of principle. He doesn't go and be with his wife because he knows that there are his, his brothers in arms are still out there fighting. He knows that the Ark of the Covenant is still out there fighting their wars. And so he is not about to go home and be with his wife when he knows his brothers aren't out there, as, aren't home as well. So why should he have what they cannot have? He's a man of principle. I respect that. And even when he's drunk, he's a pretty responsible drunkard too because even when he's drunk, he still doesn't go back to his house. David was kind of at a turning point. He could come clean to Uriah, let him know what's been going on, let him know what happened. Or he could just try and get rid of Uriah. And that's exactly what he does. Uh, Because... Like I said, sin, sin's consequences, we like to try and escape them. We like to try and not take responsibility for our actions. Sometimes the steps we have to take to hide those, to hide those consequences are different. For example, if you murder someone... You might have to do more work than you would if you just told a lie. But all sin has one consequence in common. And all sin separates us from God. And all sin separates us from God because in God there is no sin because he's holy. And try and try as he would, he could not escape that last consequence. Yeah, he could, he could find a way to make it look like he was innocent. He, he would try and find a way to make it look like he's innocent, but he can't fool God. So let's see what he tries to do, to do next. He'll send, uh, he'll send a letter with Uriah as he goes back to the battlefield. Uh, that letter will be Uriah's own execution. Let's see what 2 Samuel eleven fourteen through 18 says. Now in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. He had written in the letter saying, Place Uriah in the front line of the fiercest, excuse me, fiercest battle and withdraw from him so that he may be struck down and die. So it was as Joab kept watch on the city that he put Uriah at the place where he knew there would be valiant men. The men of the city went out and fought against Joab. And some of the people among David's servants fell, and Uriah the Hittite also died. Then Joab sent and reported to David all the events of the war. When we try and escape the consequences of our sin, we often cause more sin in the long run. David's lust started with an affair, but it ended in murder. There would have been a lot less bloodshed involved if David would have just came clean. But he's human, just like we are. 
Uh, We don't like to take responsibility for our actions when the responsibility is going to come on to us as shameful. And so we try and hide. We try and fool those around us thinking that we're these great people. I do this too. Uh, We try so hard to be the perfect Christian. We try so hard to look like we have it all together, but we're not doing anyone a favor. We're only making things worse for ourselves. Because we'll never find recovery in darkness. We'll never find recovery in a hidden place. We need to expose our sin to each other. Because only then can we be healed. We, we can do our best to try and fool those around us, but we can never, ever fool God. We're going to skip down a few verses here. We're going to start in chapter 12, verse 1. And, and what's going to happen is God's going to send a prophet, Nathan. Because God knows what's going on. There's, there's no hiding it from God. And so God's sending a prophet, Nathan... To tell David that he knows exactly what's going on. That he's sinned and he needs to repent. Check out what 2 Samuel 12, 1 through 6 says. Then the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came to him and said, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a great many flocks and herds. But the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he bought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and his children. It would eat of his bread and drink of his cup and lie in his bosom. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take from his own flock or his own herd to prepare for the wayfarer or traveler who had come to him. Rather, he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger burned greatly against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die. He must make restitution for the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing and had no compassion. Friends, I think... That our sin looks terrible on other people. Uh, That our sin looks a lot worse on other people than it does on us. You know how I know this is because that's exactly what David's thinking. And we're going to see that Nathan's actually talking about David being the rich man and, and the lamb is Bathsheba. But David doesn't catch that. Nathan is explaining to David... Uh, as clear as mud, I guess, but he's explaining to him the sin that's happened. And, and David hates it. Uh, David hates it. And I think we do too. If I were to take the ugliest parts of me and, and put them on someone else and, and expose them, chances are I would not be fond of that person. But because I justify and I lie and I tell myself it's okay because I had a bad day, somehow does that make my sin okay? Okay. Thank you, is the right answer. Somehow, does that make my sin okay? I don't think it does. And so we need to be aware of that. We need to be on the lookout that we aren't defending our own sin. Because that's not what David does. Let's see how David responds to this. Nathan is going to tell him that the rich man was him, and he's going to bring him a word from the Lord. Now, this word from the Lord may not be what you expect, so pay close attention to what God's saying to him. So, 2 Samuel 12, 7 through 12 says this, Nathan then said to David, you are the man. I always, that was always told to me as a compliment, but this is not where you want to be the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, it is I who anointed you king over Israel, and it is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. I also gave your master's house and your master's wives into your care, and I gave you the house of Israel in Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added to you many more things like these. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? 
You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife. And you've killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. Now therefore, the the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me, and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion. And he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and under the sun. Nathan exposes David's sin. And I don't know if you've ever been in this position, but when your sin is exposed, it's awkward. Because you don't know where to go. You don't know what to say. But don't we try to make excuses? Uh, God's giving David consequences in spite of his sin. Because I think that is through the consequences that we learn. That we learn that we shouldn't do that again. And the truth is, is that God is doing to David exactly what David did to Uriah. That just as David struck down Uriah with the sword... David's family is going to be in turmoil for the rest of his life. If you go on and read the rest of 2 Samuel, David's life is a mess. It's true that the sword never leaves his house. There's rebellion after rebellion, a dissension after dissension. The sword never left David's house. But David also says this, that, yeah, just like you you took Bathsheba and you laid with her in secret, your son is going to lay with your concubines in broad daylight. So I could expound on that, but I'm not going to. But we need to know that God's doing to David exactly what David's done in secret. And that's who God is. One day there's going to be a day where we can't hide our sin anymore. And we need to come... To repentance. Let's see how David responds. So David's wide out in the open. Let's see how he responds. 2 Samuel 12, 13 and 14 say this. Then David said to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord has also taken away your sin, and you shall not die. However, because by this deed... You have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child that is born to you shall surely die. God's saying that the child that that, that David had with Bathsheba is going to die. Story time. Right before Trisha and I were hired at Shelbina Christian Church, I worked for the housekeeping department at Central Christian College of the Bible. And that wasn't my favorite job at all. It was definitely not my calling. But the thing is, is that I was in charge of Lang Hall, which is the guys' dorm, and guys are messy. And so it made me really insecure about how I lived there when I was, when I lived there. I was a mess. And so I was cleaning up after them now, so I was kind of getting the consequences of my actions, I guess. But one of my responsibilities with cleaning would be I would go and I'd have to clean all the windows. Now, apparently, when you clean windows, you're supposed to do it in a circle, not just a not just a line. Is that right? I don't, okay. Uh, anyway, I was told that, but, and, and I realized that as I would, I would do it, the windows would get really smeared really easily because I wasn't, I wasn't doing it the right way. And so I, I would always wonder, go back the next day, it's like, why are those windows so smeary? I just cleaned them yesterday. And it turns out that was the problem. That's why they were smeary, because I wasn't cleaning them the right way. And, and do you know why smeared windows are a problem? Uh, Because if you look in a smeared window, you can't see clearly what's on the inside very clearly. And you get the connection. That, remember, God says to David, because of this deed that you've given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, that David was a smeared window. People would look at David and, and they wouldn't see what was on the inside very clearly. And they wouldn't see that he was actually a man after God's own heart. They would see a fallen man. 
And friends, we are not supposed to be smeared windows. Uh, we're supposed to be people who clearly represent the character and nature of God. If we're supposed to be his, his people on this earth, our windows cannot be smeared. Uh, people should see straight through us and they should see God. But at one point in our life, haven't we all smeared? Uh, we've all sinned. But the cool thing is that as Christians, we can come to a point of repentance. Notice that when David is confronted with his sin, he stops running. He makes no excuses. He simply says, I have sinned. Sometimes that's all it takes. At that moment, David stopped running. He stopped putting up these lies. He stopped trying to hide his sin. And he just acknowledged it before God. And the lesson that we need to learn today from David's life is that if we are going to be people after God's own heart, we need to have integrity. David's story starts with a poor example of integrity, but towards the end, he shows us what it's like to have integrity. He comes clean. I've heard integrity explained to me this way. Integrity is choosing a hard right over an easy wrong. And let me tell you, that wrong is so, so, so easy. It's so much easier to do the wrong thing. It's so much easier to lie. It's so much easier to give in to lust. It's so much easier to steal. It's so much easier to sin than it is to do the right thing. But let me tell you, it's always worth it to do the right thing because when you do the right thing, people see who God is. And so we started this sermon by asking the question, how do we live when no one's watching? How do we live when we feel like there's no accountability? And the answer to that, live with integrity. Uh, find some people who will keep you accountable. Uh, find, uh, you might find that in a small group, or you might find that in a close friend. If you don't have anyone, find someone who can uh, because we need to be held accountable because, like I said, we will never recover in the darkness. We need to expose our sin. We need to clear our smear. kind of rhymes. I like it. We need to clear our smear so that God can be seen in us and through us. So how should we live our lives when no one's watching? have integrity. God, I love you so much. I'm so thankful that I had the opportunity to preach today. I thank you for putting stories like this in scripture where we see, we see a man who's broken. He's been putting his identity in success. And I think we do that too, God. David is a very relatable person. And so we need to know we're going to be people after your own heart. We need to have integrity. And God, integrity is such a hard, hard thing. But we know that if we choose right over wrong, you come out on top. And that people who aren't believers, people who aren't Christians, can look at our lives and see our example of you. And they'll ask questions. And we'll have an opportunity to present them with the gospel. God, it's more at stake here than we realize. So help us live on fire for you. God, it's in your name we pray.